All right, good to see everybody again. So this is Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 2 tonight, looking at verses 1 through 7. So Revelation 2, 1 through 7. As we've talked about in the past couple meetings, that Revelation is an interesting genre, uh, lots of mysterious things in it, that it is a historical apocalyptic prophecy letter. And uh, tonight we're really going to look at some of the as is now type of things, what was going on in the churches then, the historical context. So these are historical churches that were given the letters from Revelation and they are in modern day Turkey. And the first one tonight is going to be in Ephesus. These historical churches, there are seven churches and they really do represent churches throughout the church age. You'll understand that as you look at each church that there's good things and there's bad things. There's different struggles that churches have, communities have, and Ephesus is a very interesting one to look at because we have a lot more information about the church of Ephesus in the Bible than we do some of the other churches. And the, the messages that are going to these churches are really always relevant. They're always relevant because it is speaking to different types of churches throughout the church age. There's things as we look at these letters that we should emulate, that we should do things the way that God has called us to, to live and to operate as a church. And also there's things for us to avoid. So anytime we're looking at scripture, we should really look to see what is God wanting me to do? You know, how does he want me to adjust to his word? So Revelation is not just talking about looking at the end times and seeing when Jesus is going to return and trying to figure out who the Antichrist is and all these kind of things. Again, that can be a little bit too much focus on the details, trying to look at ignoring the, uh, the forest for the trees, looking at those details. So there's things that we can apply to our life. And Ephesus is a very good example. Ephesus was actually a uh, harbor town, and they were really called the gateway to Asia at the time. It was a really major commercial, educational, and political center. And so a lot of people would go through there, lots of stuff going on. And the temple of Artemis, Artemis, was also called the Temple of Diana, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So that Temple of Artemis was very big in the town of Ephesus. And we see from, the, from Scripture that there are many Christians that had gone into to Ephesus to found the church. Aquila and Priscilla were some of the first ones there. They served in Ephesus along with Paul. And Paul served there for at least three years. So it was a long time investing into the, the churches there. And if you remember when Paul was in Ephesus, that the idol makers of the, the temple really got upset because people were stopped buying the idols because they were worshiping the true God. So there was almost a riot in the, one of the theaters. And Paul wanted to dress all the people. And luckily, those that were with Paul was like, eh, it's probably not a good idea, this riot going on here. So he got out of Ephesus. But it was th three years. And Timothy also served in Ephesus for one and a half years. So there's a lot of investment of very well-known people in Ephesus and that church. And also, the Apostle John served in Ephesus. And the Apostle John was arrested in Ephesus. So you remember, he's on the island of Patmos, and it's actually closest of all these churches, closest to Ephesus. It's off the coast. So he's on this island after preaching about Jesus in Ephesus. He'd been arrested by the order of the emperor. And the book of Ephesians is also addressed to the church in Ephesus. The book of Ephesians was written somewhere between 60 and 62 AD by Paul. And the church really was pretty healthy at that time. Now, by the time we get to Revelation, this is 30 years or so later. And really, you got other generations coming in there. And you're going to see a real big change in the church. You know, 30 years doesn't really seem like that long of a time. But a lot can happen in 30 years' time. And the church really can change drastically in 30 years. In Ephesians 6.24, Paul had referenced the church as those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. So in sincerity, they loved Jesus and they showed it by the things they were doing. Now we come forward 30 years later for the book of Revelation and the church of Ephesus is called the Loveless Church. Something happened in those 30 years. They have a problem. So in Revelation 2, 1 through 7, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. 
And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the, uh, I always mispronounce this, the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the loveless church. There are some good things at this church in Ephesus. The first verse there says, this is to the angel of the church of Ephesus. And this is how each one of the little sections for the church opens up. And we discussed in the past two lessons that the word for angel could just be messenger, which I believe is the more appropriate interpretation of this because writing to a leader of the church and there's no indication that angels lead churches in the Bible. So this is probably more like the elder or the pastor the messenger over the church. And we also know that angels cannot repent. They're, they're set. You know, what decision they make about either following God or rejecting God. And these letters call for repentance. So that's why I conclude that this is more than likely not an angel or a guardian angel over the church. But some disagree with that. But this message that comes is from he who holds the stars and is in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And we know that is Jesus. So those stars, Jesus is holding the leaders. That's the stars. We see that in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. And also that he is in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, which represent these seven churches that we're going to be looking at. So I love the fact that Jesus is in the midst of the churches because he's right there in the middle of it. He knows what's going on in the churches. And that also was referenced in chapter 1, verse 13. So you remember a lot of these strange images that we find in apocalyptic literature and revelation. Sometimes they're self-interpreted. And John has given us the self-interpretation of what these seven stars and what the seven golden lampstands are. So we got the leaders and we got the churches. And this, so Jesus is addressing this in verse 2. It says, I know your works. I know. I thought that was just a very powerful statement. Jesus knows what's going on. He's in the midst of the church. So he knows the good things are going on. He knows the bad things are going on. He knows the visible things are going on. And as we'll talk about tonight, he knows the hidden things of the heart. You know, we can fool a lot of people about what we believe and who we are. But Jesus knows. He knows our heart. He knows why we do the works that we do. Are we doing things at the ritual obedience? Or are we doing it because we love God? Christ. So when he knows what's going on in the church of Ephesus, and there are good things, there's some good works they're doing. They're really laboring. They are persevering with patience. And it also says they're not tolerating evil. But I would say they're not tolerating evil that is outward. So, you know, these sins of the world, these sins, where they don't like these things, but they're tolerating the evil in their heart and forgetting their first love. So they're not tolerating evil on the outward side. So the temple of Artemis, again, is right there in Ephesus. There's lots of idol worship going on. More than likely, there are uh, sexual practices going on for the worship of this idol as well, which was very common. Uh, the Nicolaitans also was a, a heretical group that was also right there in Ephesus too. And their culture was bad. And, you know... If this is going to be something that's really relevant to churches today, can we understand that our culture is bad? Their culture is getting further and further away from Christ. There really was a time that it was more accepted to be a Christian in America. But that has changed. And the culture continues to go that way. And we shouldn't be surprised about it, as we'll see in Revelation, things that kind of unfold. But you can still work for the Lord in the midst of that. And absolutely, light continues to shine in the darkness. No matter how dark it is, the light continues to shine. So they're working hard. They're not tolerating evil. And it says that they tested the apostles. So apostles in particular are those that are sent or commissioned by Jesus Christ. They are sent out 
to share the word, the authentic word. And it, we don't know for sure in this use of the word apostles if they were talking about just the 12 apostles and Paul or if they were really talking about teachers in general. But the authentic nature of the apostles was so important to the early church. So when the New Testament was being written, it always needed to be connected back to an apostle or an associative apostle. And then it had to agree with the testimony of the apostles that were still living. So that was such an important thing in this church as well. They were testing these messages that were coming in. They were looking at the messages that were coming from these individuals and also their character, how they were living. You know, honestly, cults start from people not testing these leaders, these people with special messages that come into the church. We have things like the Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons and just on and on. There's so many little cults that have developed over the years because someone did not test them according to God's word. If they're teaching anything contrary to God's word, God's word, they are accursed and we shouldn't listen to them. But we got to know God's word not to be fooled. And that's always been a problem in the church is if we don't know God's word, how are we going to know when we're being told lies? But they knew it. They were testing the apostles and they had found them to be liars. So God knows all these things are going on. They're working hard and they haven't grown weary. So this church has been working for 40 years now. So it's still a very young church. But at that time, all the churches were young. This is the first century. But 40 years, they had really faced a lot of persecution, but they kept on working. So lots of good things to emulate. But what about those things to avoid? So when we're looking at the churches, there's good and there's bad. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Nevertheless, Christ brings a rebuke. You know, we don't like being rebuked, do we? We don't like being told that we are wrong. But you know what? To be saved in the first place, you know what you've got to be told? You're wrong. <laughs> you've got to understand that you're a sinner. You've got to understand that you're separated from God. And as we continue to grow in Him, we need to be reminded of that, don't we? In our walk of who we are, are we really being obedient to Christ? Or are we doing our own things? Nevertheless, Christ brings rebuke to them. They had left their first love. Now, who was their first love? I'm not talking about romantic love here. Their first love was Jesus. So they're doing all this good work. All these things that from the outward people see and probably think, this is a good church. You see the things they're doing, these good works over and over again. But they had forgotten the joy of salvation. They had forgotten the cost of that love, which was the cross. And why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, because of the things they had done, their sins. They've forgotten their first love. They've forgotten why they were doing the works they were doing. And they had really come to the point where they were being ritually obedient. And this is a, always a challenge for believers. Because we like, we're people, creatures of habit, aren't we? We like to do the same things in the same way. You don't want to change the order of the service or somebody's going to get upset. You don't want to change the type of hymn book or the version that you're using of the Bible, uh, translations. You know, there's all kinds of things. We are creatures of habit. But it's ritual obedience. You know, things like today, maybe going to church, bringing your Bible, going to Sunday school, praying, reading the Bible on your own. These are great things. But why are you doing them? Why was the church in Ephesus doing these things? Ritual obedience. But there was a heart problem. And Jesus said, I know, I know. He knows what's going on inside. He knows our motives and why we're doing the things we do. This is the same problem that Israel had. In the first century, the Pharisees, they actually were very well respected among the Jewish population. And we may not get that picture from looking at the New Testament because, you know, Jesus continued has conflict with the Pharisees throughout. But the Pharisees were very obedient to the law. They were looked up to because they were ritually obedient. They did the things that God wanted them to do outwardly. But Jesus came and addressed the heart. He saw that their motives were wrong. He saw what their heart was. So this was a problem for Israel. And it was later a problem for the Catholic Church. So as the church continued to develop over time, the Catholic Church did the same thing. It was ritual obedience and not heart obedience. So we have the Protestant Reformation. A big change going on. But you know what's happened over time? The same thing. Church has become ritually obedient to these traditions, but there's a heart problem. So when we look at Revelation, it's always applicable to our own condition. We need to look at why are we doing the things that we do? Are we being just ritually obedient? 
He says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Remember your first love. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, we're continually told, remember, remember. When we take of the Lord's Supper, we remember what Christ has done and we are waiting upon His return. Remember, remember, remember. Remember your first love. Remember where you were with Christ when you were saved and see where you have fallen. You know, it's hard to really reflect on ourselves, isn't it? But, you know, that's one thing that's really important for a church coming together. I've just thought about this more and more lately of just how important it is for us to assemble together because we are not always honest with ourselves. We're not going to necessarily adjust all the time. God brings us together, a bunch of broken people, to become more like Him. He's shaping us. And you know what? Sometimes it's tough. It is tough. And it's not fun to be rebuked by those in your church. But you know, that's what we're called to do in love. Always bring people back to Christ over and over again. Remember where you were and where you've fallen to now. How do you ever worship God without love? How do you ever really serve God without love? So he says, repent. He says, turn from the ways that you're doing. Repent. And you know, when God tells us to repent from sin, it may not always be from a tangible, visual sin. Understand that. You know, there's certain things we see, like this person over here is doing drugs. This person is committing adultery. This person is doing that. On and on and on. These are very visual sins. And things you say, repent of it, you just stop doing those things. So that's very obvious. But see, Christ knows our heart. Our heart problem. He knows when we do fool others. He knows what's going on inside. He says to the church in Ephesus, repent of what your heart problem is. Address your heart. You see, Christ over and over again continued to address the heart. He told that we are not to lust because it's basically the same as adultery. That we're not to hate because it's basically the same as murder from the heart. The heart, the heart, the heart. Why do we do our works? Is it because we love Christ? And you see, this shows that our problem is really deeper than just actions. It's deeper than just doing things. And this really should hit us very hard. This shows how much we really, really, really need Jesus. Because our problems are not just doing things. Our problem is in the heart. And there's so much stuff that needs to continue to be shaped by Christ. There's so much stuff that we need to continue to give him. That problem is deeper than actions. And he warns Ephesus. He says, repent or I'm going to come and remove your lampstand. So what is he talking about there? Removing your lampstand. So this is a point that some people are, are confused or disagree about the interpretation. But we know he's writing to a church. So a body as a whole, not just as individuals. So he's not talking about coming and taking somebody's salvation away. What is he talking about with the lampstand? Do you remember we were talking about before that, that seven uh, candle with seven on there was like the menorah and they were shining light and the churches are to be the light in the world for Christ. What he was saying is you repent or I am going to come and maybe end your church or remove the influence of your church in this world. You know, there are churches closing all the time, aren't they? You wonder sometimes if Jesus is the one shutting those doors. Because are we doing things for the right reasons? Are we just doing ritual obedience and coming to church? And we don't care about those outside of the church. We don't care what Christ has called us to do. Have we remembered our first love? He warns, repent or I'm going to come and remove your lampstand, remove your influence. Now verse 6 is kind of interesting in the layout of this passage because he talks about the good of the church in Ephesus. And then he talks about the bad of the church in Ephesus and he gives a little bit of good again. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicol... Someone help me with that. <laughs> it's not Nicolaitans, it's something Nicolaitan. Those people of Nicholas, how about I say that? Which I also hate. So this is kind of a, a, um, a writing style of bookend. So we really got something sandwiched in there. You got the good, you got the bad, and you got... The, the good. So that bad right there in the middle. When I used to manage in healthcare, we were taught whenever we would do like our annual reviews that we should start out with something good, 
do the bad in the middle and then do something good at the end so they don't leave out the door with that bad. Maybe that's some, somewhat of the method here. But I see too that when he's telling them, you're hating the things that I hate. That's good. That's good. Maybe he's telling them about loving your first love. Maybe you're real close. Maybe you're real close because you're hating the things I hate. But have you remembered your first love? You might be really close to it. So this group was a heretical group in the first century. And it is thought that they started from Nicholas, who was one of the first deacons in Acts. So he was, Nicholas was actually an apostate, which is, means he was a false believer. So apostate is someone who professes Christ, but then their life obviously shows in the end that they never really accepted Christ. So again, Jesus knows who, who are his. He sees our heart. He doesn't just see those outward actions. But Nicholas, he taught them that basically they could just do whatever they wanted to do. And you know what? That sounds a lot like many churches today, doesn't it? You can just do whatever you want to do. We'll see later that this is actually a problem in the church of Pergamos. So this is a problem in this area. And maybe too, he ends in this, this section right here talking about that group. Maybe he was giving a contrast to them, thinking about Nicholas, who started this, who's an apostate. So he professed Christ, but then obviously turned from the teachings of Christ. Maybe he's saying, are you too a false believer? Are you too close to being an apostate? You say that you love Christ, but do you really love him? Is he really the Lord of your life? This group taught self-indulgence. They taught that you're basically saved, so you can just do whatever you want to do. You know, some people think that's what Baptists believe. Um, my wife grew up in a Pentecostal church, and they were taught that once saved, always saved doctrine was basically that you're, you accept Jesus, then you can just live however you want to live. Now, that's obviously not what that teaching means, but a lot of people do operate in that way. They think, well, you know, I'm already saved. What does it matter at this point? It matters very much how we live. What we do matters. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Very plain. If you love me, keep my commandments. There was a problem in Ephesus. They had forgotten their first love. Do you remember how Jesus summarized the law? Love God, love people. Listen, if you're doing good works, thinking that you're loving people, and you don't love God, there's a problem. You're never going to love people in the right way if you don't love God first. It's always in that order. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then Jesus gives a promise. So if you repent of these things, then you're going to have a reward. You know, this is a promise to, to all Christians that come to him. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So he who has an ear. That is, those who are willing to listen to the Spirit. Who is the Spirit? It's God. Are you willing to listen to God? If you are, listen here. There's a promise. He who overcomes is going to be able to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Who is it that overcomes? You've probably heard the term overcomer describing Christian. What does it mean to overcome? Well, it means true believers. So these are not apostates. These are people that will follow Christ to the end. doesn't mean they live a perfect life, but it means that they continually have a heart after God and repent. So when Christ comes to you and points these things out to you, and when he rebukes you, you repent. If you don't repent, there is a problem. It may be that that person is not really saved if they're not willing to repent when Christ clearly rebukes the things that they're doing. So this church has a chance to show who they really are. So who is it that overcomes? John defines it himself. So John wrote the book of Revelation. And in 1 John 5, 4 through 5, the end of that says, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. True believers. So these overcomers, listen up, the overcomers. You're going to have a promise in paradise to eat from the tree of life. Now again, looking at apocalyptic literature, the tree of life probably has a lot of symbolism to it. A lot of symbolism because it's really pointing to eternal life. The fact that we get to live forever with Christ in heaven. So there's a truth to that. But there was a real tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember? In the Garden of Eden, after the fall, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. And do you remember what one of the things that God said about it was? That tree of life is still there. 
Let's get them out of there. Unless they eat of that and live forever. Basically, if they eat of that and live in this miserable fallen condition forever. You see, God's working out our salvation as we speak. That He is going to redeem the earth one day. And we're not going to be living in this fallen condition anymore. So they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Have you ever wondered what the Garden of Eden is today? Well, do you remember Noah's flood? That, that garden's gone. <laughs> it's been wiped out. So we're never going to go and find the Garden of Eden in the same way that you might find other archaeological things. So it was wiped out. But there was a real, a real tree there. And an interesting comparison for where Ephesus was, they had the Temple of Artemis, remember? Artemis is sometimes represented as a date palm tree. So this might be a contrast here of saying, hey, there's Artemis over there, that date palm tree. You're going to eat death. You're going to die of that. But here's a tree of life in Christ. So there's a comparison there. But the tree of life was so important for the, for the Jewish people. In Judaism, do you know a uh, depiction of the tree of life? The menorah. That we've been talking about. That seven candlestick that they would have in the temple that they use on Hanukkah today. It was to represent the tree of life. And you remember the number seven is a number of perfection. The days of creation and God rested on the seventh. So the tree of life is represented by that menorah. And we should remember too that just like the Jewish people, that tree of life reminded them of heaven. It reminded them of paradise to come. We'll find later on in Revelation talking about the tree of life in paradise. And there's symbolism in there, but I think there probably will be a real tree in some manner. It may be something that's hard for us to grasp, but it says that we'll have new fruits every month and that the leaves will bring the healing of the nations. I love that. The tree of life bringing the healing to the nations. They understood what he was talking about here when he says you're going to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, that you are going to be healed, that you're going to be, that overcomer is going to have eternal life in Christ. So this first opening letter, as we look at the church of Ephesus, there are things to emulate, things to, to do like them, to work hard, to labor, to persevere even through persecution, to not tolerate evil, to test the message that we hear from other people. False teachers are trying to get into the church. And I tell you, they're trying to get in the church right now. As many of y'all probably know, there's a big battle in the Methodist church right now about split. And, you know, you hear a lot of things about the gay marriage aspect of that. But that's not the whole point of it. There's actually a big battle about the inerrancy of the Bible. Whether we can trust the Bible or not. You see, false teachers are trying to get into every church. We've got to be aware and test those that bring those messages. And we need to hate what God hates. We love people, but we hate what God hates, and He hates sin. But also, Ephesus gives us an example of what to avoid. Do not leave your first love. You see, we may look good coming to church on Sunday, looking all clean, and having our Bible, and doing all the things, checking all the boxes, but is it ritual obedience? He knows. He knows our heart. If there's a heart problem, Christ says, repent. Repent of it. Turn. And if you're not repenting of it, that is a problem. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to leave us alone if we allow sin in our life. You realize that? He's going to make you feel miserable until you deal with that. And all those who come to Christ have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. And continues to guide them to truth. Continues to guide them towards Christ. Repent. And if you are an overcomer, you're going to eat of the tree of life. That is the eternal life that is going to bring healing. Healing to the nations. And that is a great promise. So Revelation has a lot of mystery to it, but there's a lot of application to exactly where we are. And this is a book of hope. You think about all these devastating things that are going to happen throughout the book of Revelation, but it is a book of hope because, again, God wins. That is the summary of Revelation. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And I thank you for the hope that we do have in you, Lord, that we will be overcomers. Because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. If we have come to you. If we have accepted you as Lord. And you know our hearts right now, Lord. Have we just been going through the motions of ritual obedience? If that is so, that you bring conviction upon us, Lord. Because you know. You know exactly what's going on in our lives. You know the things that are visible and those things that are in our hidden heart. Continue to guide us, Lord. Allow your word to speak plainly. Allow your people to speak plainly to each other. And help us to stand for truth, Lord, no matter what. 
as we look throughout the book of Revelation, as we have hope in you. And we'll see these different churches and the struggles they have, the failures they have, and also the successes that many of them have, that we would know how to walk, how we could bring honor to your name, and to show that if we love you, we will obey your commandments. Guide us through this week, Lord, and help us represent you as that light wherever we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.